500. Yeah. I, and I've heard a lot of them. Uh, I feel like I've gotten to know you quite well uh, recently. You don't know that, but you and I are old friends. And um, I like your work. Uh, I like it a lot because you have... You come at these kind of self-help things from, uh, if you want to call it self-help, that sounds a little cheesy today, but uh, you come at it from a real world type of thing. I better do an intro for you, but I'll get there. You have a process to everything. You make yep. things super clear. You put, you lay everything out in, a, in the same kind of way that's very digestible. And we'll get to that in a second. I want to First of all, Foss, welcome to Over 50, starting over. Our motto here is getting just a little bit better every day, personally and professionally. So you're just the guy to help us out. I appreciate the, the uh, invitation. It's, it's good to be spending some time with you today. Well, I really appreciate that. Let's do your do your intro and get on to a whole bunch of questions I have for you. Foss Ruggiero is a psychologist who has been in private practice since uh, for 35 years. Before entering private practice, he worked in clinics for deaf children, prisons, nursing homes, substance abuse centers, inpatient facilities, and is a consultant for major national and international corporations. He is a public published research author and professional clinical trainer. In the summer of 2016, he began to develop the Fix Yourself Empowerment Series based on the Process Life Program, so as alluding to, to help readers address, diff uh, address difficult situations in their lives. The series includes the Fix It Fix Yourself Handbook, which I just about finished, the Fix Your Anxiety Handbook, the Fix Your Depression Handbook, the Fix Your Anger Handbook, which I should read, and the new Fix Your Addiction Handbook coming out in November. Wow, very quickly, very soon. And so again, welcome to the podcast. And as I said, I wanted to talk about your process a little bit. It's a definitive and it's actionable. Whereas I have read these kind of books my whole life looking to solve my anxiety problems and such. And it's really great when you read something that's insightful and you go, yeah, that, that really does apply to me and gives me insight. But if it doesn't give you action, uh, uh, something to do, it, you kind of forget about it until you read about it again somewhere else. So how did the, I'm going to guess this has just come about your process, the actionable, the intellect versus emotion. I'm going to guess this has come about from all of your clinical work. Am I correct? It, yeah, it's a combination, right? Anything we do is a combination of, you know, what we're exposed to and how we are, how we're built, so to speak. You know, and I've always been that person that says, well, yeah, great. This is all the information. Now what? You know, yes. So when I started doing the, uh, you know, if, if you're if you're going to be an author and you're going to do it properly, you do the research first. I looked at it. I started looking at uh, self-help book and prescriptive uh, uh, health books. And I said, they're given a ton of information here. And then when they're done, they're closing it up. It's like when I would go to workshops, they'd have these presentations and the screens were lit up and the whole deal. And then you took your paper home and threw it in the trash. And that was the end of the story because they didn't really give you something you could work with. Right. So I thought, you know what, let's make the chapters small, five, six to eight pages, somewhere in there, put all the information they need about any given topic. And then at the end say, okay, given this, do these things. It's what we do in counseling if we're doing it properly, you know, You've got this going on. Here's the information. Let's go. Let's go get all the facts. Now we have the information. Do these things and we'll check and see how you did what I did when I wrote. But it's not just that. Um, to, to be able to define before you can do the action, you have to define what what needs to be acted upon. And you do this thing that I've not really heard before very definitively, and that is taking the emotion out of it and just using your intellect and being uh uh, brave, not the right word, but bravely honest with your harsh. What's the word? Brutal. Brutally Brutal. honest with yourself. Correct. <clears throat> and you're right. You know, um, what, what, again, in my own life, I want to get the information. I want to get, grab all this. I want to get my emotion down because what emotion does, it does a number of things. Mm -hmm. it, it lays out a goal you already want. So the information now substantiates what you want as opposed to what's real. Uh, it colors it up and makes us overreact so the brain isn't working with it well. Then we make decisions that are that are emotionally based. Uh, they're protective or they're dealing with insecurities or just 
I want that. And that's the end of it. So, uh, you know, and, and I'm trying to tell people that emotions and intellect are both brain things. They, they, it's not like, you know, that the hallmark thing, my emotions are in my heart. That's a pump for blood. Yeah. <laughs> it's in your brain. So it's about where you supply energy first. And where you supply that energy first is how you're going to manage the energy. So I tell people, yeah, you can, you can have your emotions, but why not emote on facts? Why not emote on what's real rather than all this irrational stuff? Slow down, take a little time, get the information. Now begin to formulate your plan. I can tell you, though, as uh, reading some, I, I should say, listening to some of your chapters, I do doing the audio book. I try, I've always tried to be brutally honest with myself. And I sometimes wonder if I am to a fault. And, I'll, and other times I wonder if I delude myself. So I'll be listening to a chapter of yours and it'll get so uncomfortable. I'm like, oh, this is, oh, this is me. Oh, this hurts. I'm gonna, you know, gotta be honest. But then you'll start to talk about other aspects of this thing. Now I'm doing that right. And I'm doing it if I start to feel good again. And I'm, I'm running towards that. Do you notice that when you say doing clinical work or talking to anybody about your books? You know, what do you do with that? That's that's by design. You know, when we talk about getting brutally honest, people will say, well, how do I know? And I say, <laughs> and, and you read the book, I, I talked about peeling the onion. I said, okay, you get that. Your, your first thing about being honest is the it, it's like the, uh, the onion paper. You pull it off, no big deal. And then you get that first layer and it starts to smell a little bit. And you're just a yeah. little uncomfortable, but then you find a way to deal with it. Ah, I push that aside. Now you get to the third and fourth levels and your eyes are watering and you're saying, yeah. man, this doesn't feel good. Now you're being honest with yourself. Now, but the key to this is to understand that the things you're doing that, you know, when you're not honest, you're kind of piling junk on top of what the beauty in, in your heart and your soul. When you start getting brutally honest, you, what you're really doing is clearing the junk off and you're going to find all the beauty inside yourself. That's the journey we're talking about. Getting to that point so you can say, OK, I know I do these things. I know how I react. I know how maybe I put I kind of point my finger outward and say, well, it's not about me. It's you or that situation. I make excuses. Now you don't do that anymore. You're back to yourself and welcome to growth because that's mm. where it is. And when you start feeling it, you start feeling real good about yourself. I can do this. Mm -hmm. It's going to take me time, but who cares? I like what you said right there. Uh, it's going to take you time. You have talked about this. I don't know if on your podcast and your book, probably both, but you're talking somewhere about the process itself is something that you need to incorporate into your daily life. And when you start doing that, it starts be to become a habit and you will gradually and slowly, but surely uh, take away, strip away the crap and, re and it'll be replaced with a happier a happier direction well you know when you talk about a lot a lot of people do self-help they, they get into all the various uh, mm. emotional stuff but really you got to start with the body we're physical entities first and that's just what we are so neurologically if you look at how the brain works in order to it, you know, it adapts it, it learns it's constantly learning but learning is a function of repetition over time. So if we're going to retrain our brain to do things that are different than the way we are now, things that are hurting us or, not, or making us not feel good, well, we trained our brain to think that way, and it responded. Now, if we put the right information in and do the right things, things I'm suggesting in these books, then the brain says, all right, I got to learn a new way of doing things, and it learns. It's just like going to work and learning a new job. Your brain learns it. It applies it every day. Eventually, that becomes your default way of doing things. And I also noticed that it seems you base, uh, again, going back to your clinical background, uh, you have a very uh, intense clinical background. It seems that you've taken the 12 steps and incorporated that into almost all of your work. Is that correct? It's interesting you said that. Very few people see that. Uh, I'm not a recovering person, but I also don't use anything. Uh, but, I, you know, years ago, I worked in a prison and they hired me as, among other things, the drug and alcohol counselor. So I got a real good education there. So uh, one of the things I did is I uh, hooked up with the uh, AA people and I said, all right, let's look at the program because 
I'm going to bring this into the prison. Well, now I look at this thing and say, this is not a, as much a program for recovery as much as it is a program for de good quality living. I live by that program mm -hmm. and I'm not recovering. So yeah, you know, when, when, when I do that, a lot of that 12 step stuff is in there because it's good logical way to do things. It challenges you, you know, it keeps you on the right path. The new book, you know, at, you know, as I go, I have 13, 17 kinds of addiction in, in the, uh, in the new book. Mm. So it's not just drug or alcohol. It's everything shopping and, um, you know, uh, workaholic, all that kind of stuff. But in the end, uh, you know, every chapter has how to deal with its addiction. But at the end, the master plan for recovery, if you're, if anyone reads it and they're recovering, they say, yeah, right. This is right out of the 12 steps. And it is, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, uh, it's a philosophy that I, I use to apply along with what I teach. And it's very consistent. And the AA and NA people are telling me, man, this is right on. But it, it's it's what we do. But it's kind of out of the box just a little bit. So, you know, it even challenges us just a little. That's that when you hear that, you say, OK, we got it. We know we, we hit it on the mark. Right, right. And I think the 12th step is acts of service. Is that correct? Yeah, well, that's one of them. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, that's something that we talk about on the podcast a lot. And I, to back up and back up what you're saying, I think that the 12 steps is, uh, would help any kind of toxic behavior. Mm -hmm. And it, and all it does is course correct uh, for yeah. that. And exactly. boy, I, I found, and I've done some counseling in, in my time as well. And certainly the acts of service, it's like, if you're having a bad day, if you're not feeling good about yourself, help somebody pick up the phone and uh, call somebody, you know, that would like to hear from your mother or somebody, but uh, help somebody out, a neighbor, anything, uh, do volunteer work. That's, that's absolutely amazing. And you'll meet the best people. You start surrounding yourself with uh, very high quality people as a result. You do, you know, and, uh, and and in my life, that, that's what I do. In, in the book, in the chapter, I talk about being you know, in service in the first book. For me, I think being in service tells us who tells us individually who we are and why we're here. I think that's what this is all about. Higher order thinking, higher order behavior is about taking what you have and turning it back into the world. Uh, and and then it you know it trains your brain to work in that in that regard. But it's it's you know you have you have to be in service and giving for free. If you're looking for a payback, yeah. now you stop the process cold. That, that now you're back in you know in your own head, so to speak. You know it's about getting out of your head. Uh, you know yeah. so I agree. Uh, you know you, you and that, that that's the the higher order part of of the uh, twelve step program. You 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 learn first, then you give back. Well, that's what I'm doing in in, in, uh, in my teaching. Get yourself straight first. Can't help anyone else till you help yourself. Right. Get your get your head focused on that journey. You know, and I again, you should be. We should all be able to say, "I'm worth this. I'm worth the time it takes." It's not a, "Oh man, I got to do this every day." It should be, "Man, I am thrilled about doing this every day." You got to love the work. That's the bottom line. And when you start seeing that works, you say, give me more. You know, th that's the way it should be. Almost like a dopamine reward there. You got it. It's there. Yeah. And that's exactly what happens. Is that right? Oh, ah. yes. See how smart I am. Um, I wanted to say about the, the acts of service, once you try to get recognition for it, I think it's a Buddhist principle out of the Tao Te Ching that says, absolutely, I forget the exact verbiage, but as soon as you're trying to find um, some recognition for that selfless act. It's no longer a selfless act. Exactly. And, and, and to take it one step further, the moment you get something, that moment, mm. that's where your head has to say, how do I give this away? Mm. Uh, you know, um, it's a, uh, that's used a sports analogy. You know, the running back just, you know, blew through the line, ran for the touchdown. He can tell you how great he is. Man, I was good. I moved past this guy. I bobbed, I weaved. Yeah. Bottom line, if he's smart, he says, that offensive line yes. did everything for me. I give it away. Now, what happens is you don't realize you got two gifts. You got the gift of your touchdown, but you got the gift uh, of, of that in service, and you will feel it. All of a sudden, everything has this gratitude. And it has humility wrapped into it also. And you have a team that and, exactly. you just won their hearts. You did. And they are now 
saying, what a guy, let's block harder for him yeah. when he runs. And, and so that's what you've, you know, you've done. But the bottom line is when you get to that point, that's what I do. If I get something, the first thing, it, now it's, it's like autopilot living. I get it and I'm looking at give it away because I don't need it. I don't need that, you know, pump me up stuff. You know how mm. fast that, the, the, the shelf life on that is so short. And if I think that way, I got to keep doing that. I got to keep getting things, keep getting things so I can feel good. Once it comes into a, you know my heart, my mind that's already grateful and is humble about receiving, the first thing I think about is I can give this away. It's we're going to have twice the value, and then it, and if the other person, the next person is willing to do the same, this thing has a chain reaction that just you know it, it is is what it's just wonderful. It's huge. There's so many things I want to talk to you about, but right there, you made me think, it sounds like you're touching upon uh, your philosophy about gratitude in the book. And there's something else you applied the same thing to, but uh, like retro gratitude versus proactive gratitude. Yeah. Retroactive and, and, pro, uh, and proactive, just the terms that I use, just to communicate it. Uh, retroactive essentially says something happened. It already happened. Then there's a response. Uh, I got a new car. Man, I feel great. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, everybody. That's just, that's excitement. That's, that's uh, okay. I got something and I feel good and I feel grateful. There's a different type of, the proactive gratitude is always inside you. The littlest thing can happen and you are overwhelmed with gratitude and you're humble about it. <laughs> Excuse me. So whatever happens in your life, already comes into that repository that is it's grateful already so now you become grateful for living and everything and everyone in it you do not need the new car it'd be nice to get one and that's fine but you don't your need value goes way down and your appreciation value goes way up so you know example let's look at it today we're gonna do it we're gonna do a podcast i click on a link i get a thing back that says invalid i said okay let's try it again let's go to the e initial email that didn't work okay so i am i have two options you gotta be kidding me or <laughs> or hey we're good look around everything's fine let's relax I call my publicist, he gets in touch with you, we get a new link, here we are enjoying ourselves, having a good time, maybe throwing some wisdom out there. Nice. That's the that's the difference in the way it works. You know, it's I'm already grateful. I, it, it, if it, do I need to do the interview today? Hey, if it didn't happen, yeah. we would reschedule and we'll get this thing done. It's a, it, it changes the way your brain works. Uh, I would have been so disappointed. I was on the way to being so disappointed that this wasn't going to work because I'm so ready and excited about it. And I want to plug something before I forget your podcast. You have about 34 shows, I think. I listened to the last two. Boy, I'm going to want to talk about this, uh, the one from April about divisiveness and misinformation. So applicable, but let's wait on that. There's yeah. um, sure. the book stuff but so applicable for right now. So your podcast is the Fix Yourself Handbook. And I strongly suggest to subscribe to it, guys, even if you're not ready to purchase this book yet, which I absolutely do recommend uh, purchasing uh, Foss books. And those can be found at FossRuggero.com. And uh, that is F-A-U-S-T-R-U-G-G-I-E-R-O.com. And, um, oh, what was I going to say about, well, I don't know, but we talked about the process a bit. Oh, I know. I wanted to follow back up about gratitude. So I was at the park walking the dog this morning. We have this beautiful park with a lake over here right across the street. It's, uh, the beginning of fall. It's a beautiful day. And I took some pictures that I was going to share with you. And I did, I forgot that in my haste, I forgot to download them and all that. But my point was, I was thinking about your chapter on gratitude this whole time, because I think I'm just at about um, an intermediate stage. If I, if I'm being kind to myself in this process where I get a day like today and I am full of gratitude. I'm conscious of it. I'm trying to absorb it. I'm trying to take it all in for everything it's worth. And I'm trying to keep it. 
But boy, this is Cleveland. And we're coming into a time of year we get a lot of cloudy weather, a lot of gray skies. And then I struggle with my mood. Uh, gratitude can turn towards depression. And uh, I'm trying to remember that some of the things I've learned in your book about finding things, about looking when I need to, when it's not coming to me, the gratitude that to look for it, to look for the things that I, can you help me out here? Any tips and tricks on overcoming seasonal affective disorder? Yeah. Uh, you know, seasonal affective disorder affects a lot of people. And for some, again, you're back to biology. Uh, for some people, uh, physically, they're going to go down. There's not enough sun. There's not, mm. uh, you know, what we get from the sun, the vitamin E, uh, D and all that. Uh, there are lights available that you can bring into your home. That helps. I try to steer people away from the antidepressants and things like that. Oh, yeah. Some people will go on something light in the wintertime. But <clears throat> really, if you get one of these sun lamps and put it on, take uh, a little bit more vitamin D3. That's going to help a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the other thing is is what, what we can do ourselves, not set ourselves up for this. When you get up in the morning and say, oh man, here I go. That first statement has you plugged in to what you're going to do versus, okay, I know what, what I deal with. I'm going to look at what I can do to get through this. The vitamins, the light, exercise, because what people will do in the house in the wintertime <clears throat> the food changes. Uh huh. There's no exercise. They watch TV. They do all the depressing things that feed into it. They sleep more. Mm -hmm. You know, all those things that feed into depression. So you look at what you can do organically for your body. You look at what your mind has to do. Uh, that is by no means to minimize um, the reality of it. Yeah, this is a harder time of the year. I'm I'm in, in Pennsylvania. I'm dealing with. I, I'm on the same geographic line you're on basically uh you know and, and it answers and, one of my questions yeah the the you know we just closed the pool and the uh, leaves are starting to come down and i, I looked at my, my wife and i were talking and he, i said what do you think and she said it is what it is and i said that's where i am at this I, i'm going to embrace today mm. you know, the leaves are going to come down i'm going to look out and we have nice trees in the woods behind us and I say it's when it's green, it's beautiful. When the birds are out there and the animals, a deer yeah. coming in the yard, we're having a great time. And now it's going to get gray, brown and gray. But and not the yet. Pool is covered up. Everything from the deck is taken in. You know, everything's going to die. Yeah, <clears throat> that's the way it is. However, that doesn't mean I have to follow suit. That means I get up and say, okay, the, I, I'm going to have all these things. I have a plan, quite frankly, for what happens from October on. You know, <laughs> we'll still get. To mow the grass, do some things. November is going to hit. It's going to go yeah. down and be 40 in the day during yeah. the day. And then you know, by the end of the month, it'll be the 30s. And, you know, mm. and the snow will come and the ice will come with it. And uh -huh. you will break your back sh shoveling the slush. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know it's coming, but I'm go instead of getting angry or, or depressed about that, I'm going to have a plan every day to do to put something good in my life. Uh, I write. I, I have a gym in the basement. I, I go work out every single day. I eat exactly what I should eat. I, there are no comfort foods in my diet. I wouldn't dare put them in. I how do you don't. how do you navigate the bread thing? Wheat, grains. You're, I'm uh, coming from an Italian family. You know, right. it, 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 hi, we're carb people, not me. Yeah. Really? You, know, people say you don't eat macaroni? I said once in a while, a very small amount on the side. No, I don't. Um, yeah. I, 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 if it's up to me, I probably never buy a loaf of bread again. Uh, we no. don't, we don't bake bread. We don't do anything with the bread. Uh, everything I do my, from breakfast right through the end of the day is designed to put exactly what's supposed to go in my body. Now, you know, that's where I am in my program. And it's interesting when I tell people that they say, oh, I can't do that. And I said, well, you're not going to then. <laughs> right. You know, I, right. I look at it. My, my kids always laugh. They say my, my dad is this, is this person who says uh, he, he firmly believes there's nothing he can't do. And that is the way I, I function. Well, if that's there, I'm going to try it. Why wouldn't I be able to do it? I'm going to put all my positive energy into that that's and I'm going to go get it. Yeah. And and uh, and that's just the way I, I live. But it's now we're touching now on a different uh, strategy. It's the internal language. It's what you tell yourself. Yeah, I got that. No problem. And I'm going to do it. 
versus, oh, I don't know. I, I really like that. I hate to stop that. You know, mm -hmm. end of the day, I like to get this. I like that food. Oh, exercise. You know, mm -hmm. what, what they're, you're training your brain. Your, your brain communicates what you feel, but it also tells you how to feel. Mm -hmm. So if you're telling it, I can't, I can't, I don't want to, I hate that thing. Your brain says, I agree. If you're thinking angry thoughts, your brain gets mm -hmm. angry and you behave in that fashion. If you change it all around and you keep on pumping it full of positive energy, Winter doesn't have a major impact anymore. It just doesn't. Mm -hmm. I would say my mood kind of stays the same all year round. I like it. That Fantastic. Way. But, well, but that's fit. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's just what we have to do. It's, it's just a way, a way to speak to yourself. Mm -hmm. I know my partner Lisa has helped me out with this considerably. Um, we've been living together about the last seven, eight years, something like that. Been together 15, almost 16 years. But fall is her favorite time of year. I used to hate fall because you're kind of alluding to it. Oh, the leaves are going to come down and all the, the snow's coming. That's not being in the moment. That's not being in the present. And uh, I, our last two falls, I'm sure, same with you, our last two falls have been unbelievably gorgeous, absolutely stunning. And uh, I think a lot of it has to do, we haven't had that giant storm that comes by and rips all the leaves off the trees. It's so... It seems like it's lasted a little longer, but it's been very beautiful. This year has been incredibly beautiful. We're just barely getting in the fall. Uh, and we even, we're big family people. Uh, Thanksgiving's coming up soon enough. It's our favorite holiday by far. It's so fun. Uh, we got about 20 of the extended family that comes for this. And then Christmas. Christmas is nice too. Our problem is January 2nd and they're on. Uh, anyway yeah, February cabin fever. Yeah. And it's, that's where the dark, cold, uh, days of the year come. And I think that's where I need to make my biggest plans. I need to plan for that. I just get up, I get up every day and I say, this is the day, Lord, let's go. Here we go. And I'm grabbing, I don't, I don't think about it's January 2nd. I don't think about, we got January and February. Now we've been in this yeah. thing for four months yeah, uh, you know, and I'm looking, you know, so I just get up every day and say, okay, this is my plan for the day. I have a plan every day. And I find that people who have, who struggle with this kind of thing, they don't, their, their plan Agreed. is two, three months of winter. I'm going to be miserable. That's not a plan. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty. That's Guilty. surrender. That's what that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, that is. No, that's that's very good. Now, what we have been doing for uh, the last 12, 13, 14 years, whatever, is we go to Florida at the end of February and uh, to visit her mom. And so we got that to look forward to, you know? Uh, so that's really nice. It breaks things up a bit. You know, it's interesting. I, I, don't, I don't have tons of things that I look forward to. I have today. That's my, my, my thoughts. Yeah. You've talked about that. I know before. that you know, I've been on the East coast and I've worked and done a lot of work with the Phillies over the years. So, you know, spring training hits in February, so I can go down, but that's, that's February, right. you know, we're, we're on, we're on October 3rd today. That's I'm living October 3rd. That's what I'm living. I know that's there. We can make the plans, but I don't allow my, my uh myself to generate energy that puts me out there because that's a destination first of all that's not in today mm -hmm. so it has nothing to do with what i'm doing today and it may or may not happen i don't even know that you know who knows what'll happen you know maybe the airlines aren't flying who does a strike who uh, whatever I, I i don't there's another hurricane down there who knows mm -hmm. i know that here i am in my home in pennsylvania today I know what I'm going to do today. I knew when I got up, I have my usual social media things, all things I have to do to get my publicity going in the morning. I know I'm going to do the interview with you. I'm going to counsel people today. If I have a little time, I'm going to go mow the grass. I know what I'm doing today. And mm -hmm. I've just, and I made a decision to have fun in every part of it. Oh, that's great. And, and yeah, that, enjoy the process. And that's a conscious decision. I'm going to make this fun. <clears throat> that's all uh, i don't just... have conditions on what it has to be oh i have to do this so i can have fun no i don't mm. um, you know i i i have a friend who uh year, when we were 19 a motorcycle guy he had an accident he's been a paraplegic uh, quadriplegic for 
40, 50 years. Wow. I look at that and I say, he lives in that bed like this or the chair. <clears throat> I, excuse me. I can motor around. And just that fact right there, I can do that, puts me in a place where I have a million options. That's a fact. <clears throat> There's hey, the gratitude. You, and gratitude there, for getting up. But we take it for advantage. We take it, uh, uh, take it for granted. I you, don't do that. You were no. just dancing around uh, a very important subject matter near and dear to our hearts here in this household. That is, and you talked a lot about it. You're just like uh, approaching it. I think gratitude touches on it too. The journey versus the destination. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. If you're a destination person, for example, we'll talk about the uh, uh, the seasons. I can't wait till yeah. May. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> you do understand that seven months away, right? What's <laughs> or or I'll be better when we get to our vacation two months from now. I said, yeah. well, what about the sixty days in there? Yeah. Today is every single day you unwrap a gift. How about now? But and between go, now and retirement. The, these are the these are days of my life. This is my journey. So today I have the option of making this a great day, or I can go and say, oh, "Here I go." Mm -hmm. oh, and, and and granted, some life conditions are difficult. Maybe you're waiting for a you know you're you're, you're in, stuck in uh, a family member is going to pass, and you know you got that grieving yeah. stage that could last months. <clears throat> that's but even in that situation it hurts there are little little pieces of shun, sunshine that come through and you deal with that and you decide do you get away from how is this affecting me oh i hate this versus i can be in service to have that person experience the gift of movement to an afterlife if they if they uh, believe in that i can be that person who goes in there and changes the, that journey for that person. I have the option to do that versus, oh, I don't want to go. I hate, this is killing me. You know, death is a part of life. Yeah. We all hate it, but we have the option of what we're going to do. When people come into my office and I see their lives are being devastated, I say, all right, I have the option of being one of your bright spots. I can be there for you. Let's talk about what you need. And I'm into that part of things. So the journey is all about today. And then it'll be about tomorrow. And it'll be about the following. And I get that gift. And, and the thing is, if you can put your energy into today and make it the best day, when your life is over, it wasn't, well, I went to Italy and then we went to Greece. And then I oh, remember that time. And you have these 10 or 15 things on your bucket list. And wasn't that great? Man, I don't want to think that my life is going to come down to the accumulation of a couple of years of good days yeah. and, and the rest of it. Well, I'm in a holding pattern or it wasn't so good. Good Lord. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good. I, I, want, I want them all to be good. I totally agree with you. I got you on that. I do have a challenging question for you along these lines. What about when it's like, I enjoy most of my career. I do online marketing and it's always something that I love video editing. I love creating a, a new brand for a new company. I, I really do. I love all of this stuff and I'm grateful for being in a time when I have this technology that makes it easier for me. So I love all of that. But I can't stand doing paperwork and taxes and reconciling the books. I mean, it gives me anxiety and a knot in my stomach. And how do, okay, how do I enjoy that day? What I do is there are things, I, I don't like paperwork either. <clears throat> but, but what I do is, I, I, let, let me give you an analogy. I have people that come in and I'm trying to get them healthy. So we got to start you with an exercise program. Now they start thinking about it. Oh man, I don't want this. Oh, I know, this. I know, I know, I know this. it's, I'm going to get sore. Oh. I hate all this effort. Do I have to do this every day? What's happening? Your mind is thinking about all the negatives associated with the act. They say, well, how do you do it? Cause I'm, I'm going to be 70 at the end of the year. Uh, and people, you know, and I weigh what I weighed in high school and I, wow. I eat what I'm supposed to eat. And I, and they say, well, what do you do when you don't want to work out? I said, I never even think about that. I have a split schedule. I counsel in the morning. I, I counsel at night. After I do some writing interviews and I have 45 minutes to an hour that's going to happen. 
I'm going downstairs. I'm going, I have a, a training center set up in the basement. I'm going in, I'm hitting the machines, I'm going to do it. Now I have phased every bit of negative energy out of that. I don't work out anymore to get healthy, to goals. I go down to work out because I absolutely love that hour. That's mine. Yeah. And I don't, I never think a negative thought about it. There are days when I feel so great. I still just go down and I know when I walk out, I'm going to feel that much better. Mm -hmm. So answer to the question, no negative energy whatsoever. The task has to be done. You are going to do paperwork. So I have two options. I always say I can embrace it or I can fight it. When I started writing, you know, I sent my first book out to the copy editor and it came back and I said, oh my God, there's more. What didn't she, what did she like about the book? Oh man, there's <laughs> all these corrections. I, uh, this is insane. I had two options. I can make her my enemy. And every time I send a book to her, I go, oh, or I can say that's my best friend because what she's doing yeah. is going to help me really sell books. So I'm waiting for the next book to come back. It'll be back this week or next. Uh -huh. And then she'll have her edits. And then I will go and read through it. Most of them, I will look and say, yeah, she's right. I'll make the changes. Mm. And it'll be done. I know, first of all, it's, it's painstaking. Because editing, you know, you're really focused in. You got to think. Uh, then it takes a long time. And then, of course, what they've done is, at times, seem to Hurtful. be undoing what you did. How dare they? Yeah. You know? You yeah, know? Yeah. But I have control over what I'm doing. When it comes, I already know I have to do it. Now I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait till the, it gets there. And I'm going to get in there because that's my creation. And when it's done, we're you know the covers are already designed. Everything's ready to go. The, the, the um, publisher will do the interior and off it goes. No negative thoughts on it at all. Because the moment I do, I have taken what wasn't so enjoyable and I've tripled the amount. Yeah. Yeah. so i've always said you know i'm gonna die somewhere but i'm not gonna die because i did stupid things to get there that will just happen i have this thing that's happening it's going to happen i'm not making it worse it's already something i don't want to do now i'm going to make it three times as bad i'm going to be miserable that's good insight and plus the, the then the job that i do we know isn't going to be good because I didn't want to be there. Get this damn paperwork done. Oh, I don't care what I write. You, you can't read my writing too bad. I, it's done. And then you turn that up and then you walk away saying, who knows what they're going to say when they get that. And, and uh, you know, I know I didn't do a good job. I hated the whole process. Uh, now I'm done and I don't have a good feeling about what I did. And it's going to happen again. And you're not enjoying the journey. And you're and that and those are moments of your life where you decided to be miserable. Oh, that didn't good. make you the paperwork does not make you miserable. It's a benign chore. The emotion put into it is yeah. what made you uh, miserable. And when you get to that point and realize it, that's that's just there. <clears throat> paperwork right. doesn't have a mind, it doesn't say I'm gonna make you miserable today. It's just there. We get it and say, I'm gonna make me miserable. That's really what we're saying. And I'm not gonna do that to myself. That's good advice. You know what? You 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 use the perfect analogy for me about exercising. Cuz that's something that if I got over it, I got over that a long time ago. Cuz I I do know friends that be like, "Oh, I sat in the parking lot of the gym and talked myself out of it." And drove like, "Why are you sitting there? Just get out of the car." I that's I don't do that to myself. I don't question it. I just do it and cuz I'm going to feel mentally I need it. I do it for my mental state more than anything. Cause when I get done with that, I'm ready for the day. I do it first thing in the morning and thank God, but I can totally relate to what you're saying because when I'm putting off reconciling my books for the accountant, I make it 10 times worse than it ever was because I keep it builds and builds and it's of my own creation. You know, I follow you. There's another part of it, which is the time management. I look at the chore and I say, Okay, that's going to probably take two hours. Now I don't want to do it. Now I start wrestling. Now the conflict starts. Yeah. Now I have about five hours or 10, 10 days or whatever. And then I'm, and then I'm miserable and I hate doing this. Then I, then I do it and I'm mad and I'm throwing things or whatever I'm doing. Then it's over. I didn't do a good job. <clears throat> a two-hour job 
that I could have said, let's get in there and go and get it done and, 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 and block off that amount of time. Now I'm done. And the rest of all those hours are good. Why yeah. would I want to take those and make them all miserable? Because I don't want to do it. And I'm acting like a child here and kicking my feet and saying, I hate this and I'm not going to do it. I think I matured past that point, I hope. You know? Well, you know, you brought up a good point, too, is that if you because you recognize it and that you can get in there and get it done, there's also that feeling of a major accomplishment on the, on the other side of that. That's a really positive thing. And that builds that kind of momentum. That's great. And, and your mind understands when you're rewarding it you're when you do that just the two hours and you're done you gave your mind a reward you said you know what i'm not going to beat the crap out of you today i'm not going to get nuts i'm going to do this and it's going to be done we're not going to get crazy about doing it we're not going to have all these negative feelings and get horrible while they're doing it because i'm beating you up is what I'm doing. I'm not going to do that to you. When you're when you're done, it's like your your mind's telling you that was great. I appreciate that we got that done. And I know we can do this on the next one, the next time it happens, the next negative thing that we think is negative, all that kind of stuff. You know, there is. I always tell people there's what's occurring, and there's our perceptions and the way we deal about it, and they are very rarely the same. Mm -hmm. It's a benign task. Very true. That's what it is. Plus, well, can I ask you how much time we have? There's, I, I know what I want to get through, but we had a hiccup and, um, yeah, I got, about, a, I got, a, I got a good twenty minutes. 25. Okay, good, good, good. Because uh, I should have done this as bookends, but I just started talking and we got into it. Uh, but I, I, because I haven't heard you talk about your childhood, what your parents were like, how you got into this uh, field that you seem perfectly made for. Then there's another thing I want to talk about, the other end of things. I want to talk about you. I know that you're self-published, and I want to talk about how you put a team together. That Because, yeah. man, your your books are tight. I mean, the information is really tight. So very professional. I can't imagine how you even got started. So let's let's start with your your childhood, if you if you would. Uh, sure. Did you grow up in PA? I grew up at, right, right near where I live. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Italian Catholic home, mom, dad, four kids. Uh, everything going great. My, my father was a civil engineer, uh, worked for the Department of Highways in Pennsylvania. Very, very successful. My mother was a secretary for uh, several years, worked at the Pentagon as a secretary there before she came home and, and, and my parents started the family. Uh, everything going great until I was about nine. My father had a stroke, pretty bad stroke. Um, so life in the family would change then. You know, he really, really took a hit physically. Um, so, you know, now there's me. I was this introspective, um, help the world. I'm going to, you know, be that guy that helps everybody. I was already there by the time I was eight wow. or seven or eight years old. Uh, now I'm, you know, second of four kids. I'm going to take over for dad. No, you're figuring out how to be nine. You're not, my mother was right there. That's not happening. <laughs> I'll, I'll be doing this. You, you will help. Some of the chores will change. Some of the things will change, but you're not, but, but you know, nine, you know. Test, testosterone's right around the corner. I got this, you know. Right. Yeah. So now you you realize your limitations, but you also get to the point where you say, "Well, I upped my game just a bit, and my head understood it." I think, uh, okay, uh, I'm able to do this. Now I'm going to school, and kids are, you know, having problems, and I'm listening because I love to listen to people. I'll listen to them all day long, mm -hmm. and uh, so I became one of those people, you know. Hey, what do you think about this? Well, by the time I'm in high school, I knew what I was going to do. Wow. You know, so uh, and I, I never looked back. I mean, and I have lots. I have I'm one of those people with I'm multi interest person. I have five things that, you know, that, uh, six things I'd love to do. Uh, this was the big one. So, you know, then it was college, grad school, uh, get out and I diversified my program in college. So it was normal development, abnormal research. I want to make sure I had all the components got out and then said, let's diversify again. Let's go work in all these different places. So I have reference points that are, you know, very different and uh, worked all those places, then hit private practice. And I've been doing that uh, since 1988. Uh, came to retirement age and said, yeah, I guess. And I, then I said, no, I don't think so. I so know. I hear the you. Office, the practice back to the house. And uh, yeah. here we are. I see about 25 people a week still and, uh, and write and do interviews and, all those little things in the meantime, you know, 
I'm, I'm one of those guys that gets up and, you know, 7.30 or so in the morning and I go to midnight and I don't have any accelerants whatsoever. I just, I, I, my mother used to say, you're like a calm tornado. You never stop turning, but you never get crazy. You know, and I think wow. that's always been the secret, you know, just keep going. Well, I got to tell you something. I had um, I've been going this week through one of the my one of my semi regular bouts of not getting good sleep. I, I go to bed, I watch some stuff on uh, the laptop, and try to get to sleep. I kind of normally sleep from about ten thirty to five. I like to get up at five, and then I go to work out and start my day. Um, I've been getting up at three thirty uh, all this week, and. Now and then I go through it. You just said that you go from like 7.30 to midnight. And is that, I'm wondering if I should just go later into the evening so that I go to bed when I'm tired. And that's what that's, what that's for. Instead of going and watching a movie, YouTube, this, that, or the other, and getting wishy-washy. What do you think about that? Well, you know, it's interesting you said that, but I had... Since I was a kid, um, I was this, you know, my, my, my brother and I shared a room. He's one of those guys that he's asleep. He used mm. to make me crazy. An hour later, I'm still laying there, yeah. you know, and, um, you know, you know, I, I, I was the kid with the flashlight under the covers and the book uh. and whatever I could do to. And, and my father finally said to my mother, just let him stay up. It's not that he's doing anything wrong. He's. This is, a, and I think he was the same way. This is a kid that's not going to go to bed early. So let him stay up, let, but give him, you know, constructive things to do. So it was all, so I've been, you know, by the time I was eight, nine years old, I was going to bed 10, 30, 11 o'clock. I'd still get up in school for school, have all the energy in the world that I needed. Uh, and, and now it's the same thing. Uh, but I have uh, a, a schedule where I get up the same time every single day of the week. I go to bed the same time. Mm. So my body's already tied into that. And then I have a, a kind of a, um, a schedule at the end of the day where I just flow into, into uh, what I'm going to do. Um, I have, uh, you know, I have some of the herb teas and we'll maybe relax and watch something nice on television, easy going. Then I have mm. a hot tub before I go to bed. I'm in there every night for about a half hour, 30 minutes. Nice. When I get out, I am kind of, I can feel, okay, now I'm ready to go to sleep. Still takes me about 15 to 20 minutes to fall asleep. Mm. And I don't worry about anything. It's just, I get there, my body just says, well, we'll go. When we get there, we get there. So mm -hmm. it's going to be midnight most of the time, just because that's where my body is. I've tried to train it in other ways. My oh. bile rhythms go there. That's yeah, where people are different. Yeah, some people are very definitive. And I, I'm an early morning, early to bed, early rise guy. I always have been by nature. Uh, and I know people like you, just just the opposite. And it doesn't seem like you can really change it. You can modify a bit, but not really change it. Yeah. Um, programming, TV programming. You talk about trying to watch something easygoing as you're winding down. TV programming today is tricky. It's it's very dark, you know, media in general. It, it seems like our media is geared towards narcissism, for sure, uh, whether it's reality TV or whoever's trying to get in the press and all of that. And programming is dark, generally dark. And so I I prefer to watch what try to I'm going to I'm try to be cognizant of what I'm watching as, before I go to bed. But I'm just saying it's hard. It's hard today. It's kind of like our food. Uh, it's it's also hard to really eat natural and healthy. You hit on an interesting point. It's hard, as people will say. So the decision is already made. So the mind is already geared to eating the wrong things. Mm. I see. I know it's wrong. I should do this, but I like that. Well, now I can look there's with the way television program is today and streaming, there's a multitude of things to watch, God, yeah. but our mind is already saying, but I like that. And that's what I tune into a, a real good example. I have a, a girl I was working with who would wake up every day at four o'clock every morning. I said, what do you do when you wake up? I try to fall back to sleep, then I can't. So I get my phone out and I just kind of do that till I could fall asleep. I said, what you've done is set an alarm in your brain for wow. yourself to wake up at 4.30 every morning to do your phone. Mm. It's people who wake up hungry. You don't wake up hungry. Your mind is, the alarm went off. Now you're going to go out at three o'clock and 
go get your piece of cake or whatever because you don't go out and and, and make a salad you just don't do it you know you go get <laughs> right. your comfort food you go back to bed you got you know 15 or 20 pounds later you're wondering what's going on you, you, you the mind is already geared into it um you know so what we do is and, and some of the stuff we may watch at the end of the day it's only for an hour or so maybe on the corny side if you will or or maybe something that's really you know not not something i was always geared to but i know that i get involved maybe it's a period piece you know and i mm. get involved in it and, and it's nice and easy and i can turn it off and say all right that was helping me mellow down you know because i have one of those brains that it engages you know yes. that's just me I'm not watching a comedy. I it's a waste of time in my mind. Uh, Give me a plot. I want to get into it. I want. To, <laughs> I'm going to follow the writing. I'm going to follow directing primarily. Uh, uh, the acting is actually number three. You uh, know. So so I, I yeah, so I'm into it. So I know if I'm going to do that. If I get it. If I put something intense on, I'm in it. And then when I go to you know, okay, it's turned off. Okay, <laughs> I'm still going. You know? I'll be I'll be redoing the plot. But give me something light that keeps me keeps me interested. Yeah. mellows me you know i'm not the guy that's going to turn on um thursday night nfl with my team playing and i just have you're in cleveland i've been following the browns since i'm five you know oh and, god you know talk about i'm sorry talk about anxiety <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm so sorry um i gotta tell you just briefly lifelong rabid browns fan they really lost me with that the worst trade in the nfl uh, and the history of the organization when the day they made it i said oh my god yeah They're it was a bad day for me but thank you for giving texas a potential championship yeah yeah yeah, yeah for sure and they did <laughs> they, they did i haven't followed texas this year but yeah they made out like bandits on that deal i want to put in the back of your head uh because you talked about loving writing and directing and stuff. I'm the same way. Uh, at the end, if we have time, I would like to ask you for movie or TV recommendations. But right. there's a few things I want to hit. And if we don't hit them all, that's fine. Wouldn't mind talking about today, uh, the state of anxiety. We just started talking about anxiety and anxiety is through the roof today. Also, divisiveness and misinformation. Um Now, as we lead up to November, it's at a heightened pace that I've never thought we could get to. And I also do, though, I want to talk to you about self-publishing your books, because I think that you climbed quite a mountain and you got on the other side of it. And I wonder what the secrets are. Maybe let's start there. With the book, what I, you know, for me, being a guy that wants the information, I, I did what 90% of the authors don't do. I learned the publishing industry first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I talk to agents, I talk to um, copywriters, I talk to people, publishers, and I said, let's look at what's out there. Uh, so it was, you know, lear uh, learn that industry, learn how it functions. So when I began to write, I knew what I had to do to, to be there. I, I knew everything, as much as I could possibly know about publishers and agents copywriters uh the you know the difference between self-publishing and, and and going on a traditional basis everything i you know so now it's just it just clicks the next thing i said when i made a decision i started with the agent thing but the more i and i had agents that were willing to work with me and i but but you have to do this and you have to change this and we want okay. this and here's the and i said wait a minute you're changing everything that I'm doing. And then I realized that when, if you do that and a publisher wants your book, you lose the rights for your book. They buy the rights mm. and now they own it. I, well, I didn't like that. And is that basically in trade-off for their marketing machine? Yes. They're yeah. doing everything for you. You're yeah. still going to make the same money. You might make more in the beginning. It's a slower process to do it the way I did it, you know, mm. um, because you, you, you're starting from an, as an unknown commodity and you have to get out there and work your tail off. But what I did then was I said, okay, you know, I had to start with a copy editor. I mean, I had someone that's going to go through all of the books. So I put that uh, person in first, then a publisher, uh, which is another, a fella, an air married couple. I'm, I'm fortunate. Uh, so she does the editing, comes back to me. Uh, and then he does gets the the exterior and interior of the book. Mm -hmm. I have those. I have agents who I can call. Uh, they're willing to talk to me. Um, I've got all the people in place from the beginning 
to the end. It's it's my whole network. Then the publisher comes in who you've been uh, talking about. So he's going to go out and help me publish it. It's an expensive proposition to do it this way because you're going to pay a publisher. You're going to mm-hmm. pay the editor. You're going to pay your publicist. They're, it's not cheap. But in the meantime, now it's running. It's up and running. And, you know, I'm almost 500 interviews later and I'm, you know, it's television and it's uh, mag. I think I've published like 30 magazines now, you know, so but it is if you look at it, what I just told you is it mirrors the way I run my life. I don't mind the work. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make it fun. I'm mm-hmm. going to get all the information, get all my ducks in a row, hit every T and I and cross them and dot them. And I and it's it, and it is seven days a week. Doesn't mean I'm engaged the whole time, but someone may call and say, hey, uh, you know, my publisher may, may say somebody wants to do an interview, but it's like Sunday afternoon at five. Yeah. Will you do it? Absolutely. You know, huh. uh, you know, we had what we had this morning. Yeah, but we go work with it. We get going and we're we're in. It's mm-hmm. if you're willing to do the work and you put the team in place. Then you're good. Today, most people are saying, well, I want to write a book. This is what I want to write. Even when I write the book, I I, I, I just did the one on addiction. I, and I know addiction inside and out. But I still went back and put in about three months worth of research. Let's go find out what, what what's happening with neurology. What's happening mm-hmm. with all the physical stuff? Uh, is AA changing a, at all? Um, mm-hmm. let, let's talk about all the various kinds of addiction and I had to research every one of those. When I'm done, I know what I want to do. Now I put my outline together. That's chapter by chapter. So it's the new book, I think, has 29 chapters. So there are 29 chapter outlines, all of them written up. Now when I go back and I go from one chapter to the next, I I already established the flow. I can change a little bit of it. uh, But now I I I establish that and I write according to my outline. Do you use Scrivener? Do I what? use scrivener it's a it's a it's like um ai no no it's a it's just like um it's 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 a program an app that uh is like word processing very simple but it's just a series of folders and files so that when you write chapter one you can move these pages around in folders yeah, easy i um, don't i do a lot of it very organically like i you know i've always done and i like that like in uh, word or something yeah, I just I just get it in Word. That's what, that, when you write, you really you write in Word, mm-hmm. uh, and then you send that to, to your uh, copy editor, and then you know it goes back and forth till you get it where you want it. Then it goes to the publisher, who then puts it in Adobe, and and that's where it's that's how the book is going to be published, mm-hmm. and uh, and then uh, he sends it back, and then you look th- uh, for uh, through that, make sure everything's good, and uh, then you're ready to go. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you, I know it's backing up a little bit, but your uh, experience doing clinical work in the prison with addiction, was that like the mega point in your career? It's like oh. head exploded, like learn more there in a concentrated period of time than any other yeah, time. That's where that's another one of those times where you walk in and, and I had done some part time counseling. So it wasn't like the jail was new to me, uh, but I got in and I said full time because when you do it part time, this is cool. You know, <laughs> now all of a sudden you're. Look around, you say, Oh, yeah, what am I doing here? Yeah. I just went through all these years of training and school at, to work in this place. But you know what? Then you start, it, it tests you. Oh, yeah. Uh, not just, you, you think it's the inmates, it's the system that tests you. Mm. Inmates are just people. You bring them in, you counsel them like you counsel anyone else. You know, they have some different problems, some of them more intense. Uh, you, you get some, uh, you, you know, the psychoses are different, you know, the, uh, all that stuff. Okay, but it's the jail system, the power system, the use this, use that. Um, it, it's a whole different way to live life. So it challenges you and it, you have to keep your your dignity and your morality where it needs to be. Um, and, and, and you want to be able to look at these people you're counseling, not as the you know, the world's vermin, they are good. A lot of them very good people who just sure. didn't have the breaks. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it really had me in a position where uh, I had to keep myself in check, my emotions where they needed to be. Uh, I had to remain, uh, you know, street smart, but humble at the same time. 
you know, and, and, and not allow my myself to become arrogant there because it's very easy. Uh, it, it, uh, you get jaded very quickly in a, in a system like that. Can't allow that to happen. So a lot of life changing things there. It's, if I look back at something, at one of the things in my life I would not change, my the five years I worked at that jail would be one of the ones I would not change. I would never wow. want to. That you had to either. grow astronomically yeah. from that. Yeah. Yeah. We grow from uh, challenges and hard times. And if everything was easy, we'd never grow. So yeah, for sure. Because I want to just get to these things. I don't want to miss them. This is the most important one for us today is let's talk a little bit about the, the, the divisiveness of today, the misinformation that's being put upon us all of which I'm sure is 100% intentional to keep us back on our heels so that we don't address the real problems that are out there, even as an election comes up. What do you think of that? You know, I just uh, did a an article from a magazine that, uh, on what I call the fundamentals of intelligent voting. And I really use the philosophy I had, the information gathering, the keep your emotions in check, watch the sources of your information. Um, what, what's, what happens... <clears throat> An election year is not, it's just a microcosm of the way we're already living. Uh, you mm -hmm. look at what they're doing. They're attacking each other. Yeah. And if I said to you, pick a candidate, vice president, what's her platform? They're going to look at me and say, what's your foreign policy? What's she going to do? Huh? Yeah. Okay. What's her stand on, uh, on the wall in the South? Well, I know she doesn't want it. Okay. Then I say yeah. this, and you can say it to Mr. Trump too. What is the plan? This is what I ask people. Do you know what their plan is on all of these? Boy, right? Oof. Do you know, did they tell you what they're going to do? Did they tell you how they're going to do it, when they're going to start? And did they give you a way you can measure their success? And all those answers are no. Mr. Trump more, he, you may not like him. Okay, a lot of people just, you know, he, he, he's not the antichrist. He's just a guy that bucks the system and they don't like mm, him. Right. Okay. But he gives more of the plan than she does. That's all performative uh, over there. It is. So, but he's not either one of them. You know, it's a, a, a lot of verbiage, but where's the plan? Hollywood comes in and backs one and, and they say, so-and-so now just came out. Uh, and I say to them, I, yeah. The glitter people, did they give you any information? Yeah. Make your decision on not just the presidency, on anything you do in life based on grabbing the information, going to the proper sources, getting your emotions out of it. Almost 90% of the people who vote, I guarantee, will vote with their emotion, not mm -hmm. their brain. We're treating this, I went on a rant about this about two weeks ago on the podcast. I was just very angry. Well, it was right after that debate with Harris and Trump. And I thought, uh, boy, Trump had, and I'm I'm a staunch, uh, what's the word, but um, um, independent. Mm -hmm. I'm just so committed to my independent values because I know if I join a team, the team will shift underneath my feet. And... Uh, We've seen that happen with our parties. So I and I think that when you the closer you are aligned to a team, the more that you will shift the truth for yourself in order to align with it. And I want the truth. That's and what I call the herd mentality. Mm, sure. Follow along without questioning. You're right. Without, that. Yeah, that's that's for sure. So what I've been very angry about it, you were just speaking to is that we're just talking about the performance now. Who gave the better performance yes. in, a, in a debate? And you're saying, well, I want information. I didn't get information. And, but people are like literally conversations I have. But who performed better? I mean, for the love of God, it's like we're auditioning for a high school musical. And this why is we, my question was, why are we even doing debates? They tell me yeah. zero. Agreed. They should put, if you want to do this, you say, okay, here's the question. I want to know, pick one, uh, the wall in the South. I want mm -hmm. to know what your position is. I want to know how you're going to do it. If you're saying, I want to build a wall and keep them out, we're going to, we're going to go through every one of these people and make decisions. I want to know how you're going to do that. If you're saying, we're just going to let them in and uh, try to help them. I want to know how you're going to do that. L whether one or the other is not the point, the decision. I want to know what drives the decision, yeah. how you're going to do it. I haven't heard that yet. 
Right. I, I don't care about debate on. You're right. It's a performance. You know? Right. And, and you already go into a debate. You didn't go there and say, well, I don't know. Let me see how they go. Well, now <laughs> you go in and say, I hope my candidate wins because right. the party system in and of itself, for, we have outgrown the party system. That's never, I've never heard that said anywhere, but it, it divides the nation. It doesn't unify it. Correct. We should just have candidates that the population picks. So you're, you're you're the guy. Hey, look at what you're saying. I like the way you're presenting it. I mm-hmm. like what your policy is. My favorite one is abortion. You yeah. do realize the president has Smoke nothing. The, the president has nothing to do whether right. a, a, abortion flies or not. That's a Supreme Court issue. It's, it's pure done. distraction. Yeah. And had voting for her because she wants uh, abortion or him because he mm-hmm. doesn't is irrelevant because neither one of them have, have anything to do with that subject. It's a diversion. You are correct. Yeah. Oh. It, it's designed the, the that part of the nation, the, the power people do what, like to keep us as dumb as possible. They yes. don't want us to be intelligent. They just want our vote. Right. And we have to look at that and be able to say, let me buck that a little bit. Let me say, I'm going to be a person. I'm like you. I will not affiliate with a party. Never have, never will. Right. All right. I'm going to look at what's there. I'm going to I'm going to put them through my scrutiny. And if neither one of them come through, I'm not voting for either one. That's it. Right. No, I, it. I'm not compelled to vote for one or another. I, right. I'm, I'm going to vote for if I, I'm going to vote. I'm going to vote for someone because they show me that they're capable and I hold them accountable to that. And we don't hold them accountable for anything. For sure. I like what you said about the no party system. My usual co-host, Merle, he's an advocate of that too. And the more I thought about it, it's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm totally on board or at the very least we need two more parties, a moderate, right. yeah. Moderate left, moderate, right. And now we have a democratic choice. Right. Exactly. All right. Exactly. But they don't want that. They want the divisiveness. For them to, it's the old divide and conquer. You know, we keep yeah. racism going. They keep it going. We got to, phased out at any time we wanted to. Uh, discrimination against uh, faith groups, against older people. You know, the, uh, you know what? We keep that going. They're all diversionary tactics to keep For people sure. off base. Abortion in an election is a diversionary tactic, and people Race. will vote for one or the other based on that issue. Right. Which is but insane. You- you know, we will sacrifice children in the name of divisiveness. All this stuff going on in the trans community and uh, trying to let puberty blockers come into uh, school systems. And uh, if they have their way, they won't let the parents know what's going on. And they'll start a kid on puberty blockers without their consent. That's crazy. Can you believe we live in a day and age like that? Well, that's where it's going because we, the mind is expansive. Once we give it something, it's, it's, it's not, that's why addiction occurs. It's not satisfied. It wants more and more and more. So we've taken that, they call it, call it the left, call it whatever you want to call it. And we have gotten to the point that we don't know how to put the brakes on and we've yeah. normalized that process. When you normalize the process and you're saying, yeah, we can keep on doing that. Where do you stop? That's where, that's where we get into that conservative versus liberal kind of thing. Conservatives right. trying to put the brakes on. They're both saying, "How dare you?" And and it, none of that works. Again, we're not we're not going through the information. Marijuana was another example. We wanted it absolutely, not for medicinal purposes. Another diversion. We wanted it because we want to legalize a drug that we have fun with. That's all. Right, and it's good tax income. That's for exactly. Sure. There's a, there right. are all those underlying reasons. Right. That's how we we do what we like first. We don't have a plan. And then we try to figure it out later. And we do that across the board. Oh, that's a good way to put it. With that, let's let's start wrapping up. I want to ask you, did you have any TV or movie recommendations? Anything that you've watched recently that you really like? If if you're of the uh, mind that you don't mind the violence and all that whole kind of thing, Peaky Blinders was fantastic. I've heard great things about it. I feel like I maybe watched the first episode and it didn't take. But uh, you, you I have, always you hear have, about it. You have to get into about four, four or five episodes, uh, and then you're saying, "Oh my goodness," you know. So we watch that. If you're looking for uh, something to wind down with, but you got to be on, uh, you know, more, it's a little bit spiritual. Uh, but I, I just started. I, I, I follow an actress. 
for 50 years. Her name is Jenny Agutter. She's a British actress. Heard of her. I want to type her name in, and this thing comes up, Call of the Midwife. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it, and it, it's about some nuns who have nurses that live with them, and they go out and deliver babies. But th they attack every social issue, from abortion to uh, you name it. They attack everything, but it is a wind down kind of show. That's what I'm watching right now at the end of the day. They, Call they, of the Midwife. They want, yeah, they okay. they wanted to do this for a, a, a quick six episode thing. They're in season fourteen. It took off that way. Wow. In Britain, and now it's hit this country. It, it, the it, the writing is perfect. The direction is perfect. Acting is exquisite. Uh, Vanessa Redgrave uh, um, narrates. Uh, Jenny Agutter and a whole lot of British actors, act, actors and actresses who are accomplished people have stuck with this thing. And, uh, you know, so, you know, those two things, if, you, if you're if you into the act, grab I mean, grab me and my adrenaline's pumping versus grab my heart, grab my my mind and watch me deal with humanity. That's mm -hmm. the key. That and that's Call of the Midwife? Call of the Midwife. And hey, where do you catch that? Netflix, both. Oh, okay. And I am sorry, what was the first one? Peaky Blinders. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what is it about? P is it Peaky or Pinky? Peaky. P-E-A-K-Y. Uh, Peaky, from what I understand in Britain, is, is stylish, in style. And the oh. blinders are the hats they used to wear, those fold-down kind of hats. Oh. So they call themselves the Peaky Blinders. They wore those yeah. hats. That's and that. What is it that grabs you about that show? Oh, it, 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 everything. Everything. The direction, the acting. Um, Cillian Murphy, who got the Academy Award, he, he's great the actor. Show. Yeah, he's something else. And, and, but the cast behind him is perfectly matched. The writing is exquisite. The direction is right on target. And it keeps you, it, it's it's intense enough that it keeps your mind right on it. The whole I'm going to give it another chance. And I'll put it in the show notes too. I like the recommendations. With that, I'm going to let you go. But I'm going to leave you with one thought. I hope that we get to do another show sometime. And I want to talk to you about faith. And that's a big topic. And that is going to be my seventh book. Are you kidding? Really? Book, yes. I. It's something I'd really like to talk to you about because I approach it from such a pragmatic point of view. I understand the importance of it. And um, I, I follow a lot of near-death experiences trying to piece together these mysteries and stuff. And, oh, it's a big, heavy topic. But it's yeah. a whole nother podcast. Good. Absolutely. Okay. Well, with that, let's uh, let's take off here. Hey, everybody, go to over50startingover.com. Sign up there. Get this all to your email list as it happens. And uh, let's make sure, you know, Foss, let, let me ask you, where would you like people to find you, reach out to you? Now, the best place to find me is on my website. You said it before, www.faustrivagero.com. When people get there, all the books are there, uh, but there's excerpts from every book, all five books. So there's three chapter excerpts on each one. You can look at see how I write and what I do and decide whether it's for you. Um, everything, you know, interviews, all that stuff is there. So you can see me, podcast, all that. And there's a contact link and I do get back to people. That's fantastic. And I definitely want to say, you know, start off by signing up for his podcast at uh Fix your, the Fix Yourself Handbook. I'm really enjoying it. I got about 30 other episodes to listen to yet and uh, can't wait. With that, Foss, thanks so much and have a great weekend. Hey, you too, bad. God bless. Hey there, over 50 starting over friends. How are you? Mark Tennant back with you here for your AI tip of the week. This week, create that weekly planner that you've always dreamed of with the help, of course, of ChatGPT. Let's get started. Well, weekly planning, it can be a hassle, overwhelming, especially with our busy schedules, common issues. There's the list. You probably have your own reasons for creating your own schedule. So let's get started. Let's uh, use our best solution that we know of right now, ChatGPT. Open it up and let's get prompting. We can start with this basic prompt. Help me create a balanced weekly schedule. And once you insert that, and this is what I got back. Not bad. It asks you a bunch of different categories. It numbers those categories, a couple of questions with each category, and you do your best to answer those. So the AI gives you what you want. So for a tip, what I like to do is you'll notice all the categories are numbered. One, two, three, four, five, six. I like to create my response to each 
number, in this case, each, each question. So with number one, I answered 40 hours a week. Number two, exercise, and you can see down the list. Fed that into the AI and ChatGPT, not bad. It came out with a pretty good schedule. I wake up in the morning at 5.30 all the way till I go to bed at 10.30. I told it that in my response to its questions, and it broke out my day pretty, pretty decently. But Saturday, Sunday, not bad as well. But let's go back, and we always want to refine our prompts always tell you to do that. So I'm actually more productive in the mornings than I am in the afternoon. So I, in this prompt, I'm more productive in the morning, adjust the schedule accordingly. And boom, it did. It actually really, really broke down my schedule much better to emphasize a lot of the work in the morning and kind of taper off in the afternoon. Same thing with Saturdays and Sundays, not bad at all. So remember, always refine those prompts till you're satisfied. Maybe you want to ask it, what weekly chores may I forget or something else you might forget? Have that conversation with the chat. Break down my Wednesday so I'm not as busy. Those types of things. Again, just keep narrowing down and getting more focused on your answers till you get what you want in the proper response out of the AI. Benefits, of course, you can save time on planning, create more balanced and realistic schedules. You'll reduce your stress time. Hopefully you won't forget anything and improve that productivity. So quick tips before we leave you, don't forget, be specific with your prompts. Always narrow down your focus, iterate and refine with ChatGPT and create a prompt framework. Um, we talked about those and exactly how you would prompt the AI and always apply your own judgment when looking at AI and using those answers because you know sometimes it can hallucinate. So remember, ChatGPT, the goal here is to make planning easier, not to add complexity. Don't forget that. So. Until next time, as we always tell you, keep refining those prompts, keep using AI, and invite you to go to my website, Mark. I've got some different uh, things that I'm always putting out, some tips and uh, tricks as well. Email mark at marktenet.net, and I invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn, Mark E. Tenet. So until next time, have a wonderful week. Keep prompting and take care.